long enough, you get to do a bunch of stuff. That's what I got out of that. Um, thank you very much, Bram. I really appreciate the introduction. It's very kind. <clears throat> so IDEA is a big partner of mine. Uh, we work hand in glove. We need you. Um, our, our team is uh, very tightly aligned between the government employees that work directly for me and the IDEA folks, as well as other participants, but uh, IDEA is a big part of our daily work. So I'm especially happy to be among you here because these kinds of events where we exchange information, we work across the seams of the, uh, the tactics, techniques and procedures, if you will, of how we do our business, and opening up innovation to us from outside as well as providing the things that we uh, understand and evolve in our practice to others, uh, that rising tide that raises all boats. It's an important part of our work and something I intend to exercise going forward. So I'd also like to thank the NASA and the American Statistical Association for being a part of this, the opening up that aperture outside of the Defense Department. We have a tendency to wander around inside our, our own hallways, but getting out and bringing in information from others as well as exposing it is an important part of this conference specifically and a part of the leadership that I'm going to bring to the department and DOT in, in specifics. So um, we are on the cutting edge of what it takes to field militarily excellent systems and we need to tap into your innovation. You're working every day at figuring out how to do this business better. We want to capture that and make it more broadly available. All right, so um, in fact, I, I was able to get a little bit of uh, Dr. Marlowe's talk yesterday, and there's a lot of common ground in what our agencies need to do together. I'm looking forward to working with uh, NASA and uh, other uh, participants in this community. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, uh, I was particularly happy to hear, Bram, that we we're talking about uh, you know, having an open publication forum uh, DOTNE has a public facing website. Uh, we'll point to it as well so you can get to there from uh, the place you go to see my stuff as well. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to build that into a, a, uh, and broaden it to include even uh, greater opportunities to learn how to do this business better. All right, I, you know, I've got so much to cover. And one of my problems is I'll go charging off into an area and I'll end up repeating myself. So I'm working from notes here so I have a more comprehensive chat with you uh, to make sure that I don't miss any parts and I, I weave it together more artfully. So bear with me, please, in uh, reading from notes. Um, also, not to be under, underestimated is the value of getting together kind of in the hallways and over coffee making connections, passing business cards around, and, and thickening our relationships with like-minded and like-concerned professionals. Um, understand that DataWorks also reaches an international audience, which I'm particularly interested in as well. Um, that's a part of dot &E, right? We, there's, we have a foot in international test. We uh, both provide and use um, uh, facilities in other places. Uh, probably not as much as we could, uh, but that's an important part of our business as well. Um, I won't go through my uh, background. Uh, Dr. Willow did a more than good enough job of that. Um, but for those of you who are not familiar with uh, dot &E specifically, and I know we got a lot of people from IDA here and some people from my shop here. By the way, those of you from dot &E who were able to make it here today, either live or virtual, thank you please do more of this. Um, so, uh, just a little bit of background on my office for those of you who aren't uh, kind of in, inside uh, ball players. Uh, as as uh, Bram mentioned, I have a reporting requirement statutorily actually, both to the Secretary as well as to Congress, directly and independently, which, is, which means I'm kind of grading other people's homework and giving bad news to good people. We call balls and strikes, and it's nothing personal, it's just business. But having that independent look is especially important because we kind of, we, we left our own devices, our program managers, and I used to be one, we'll, we'll write our own test and we'll give ourselves a good grade. But that's not 
to the benefit of the taxpayer or the warfighter. So having that, uh, that, that teacher that grades the homework that gets you that independent view of whether you actually accomplished what you either set out to do or what you need to do is the critical part of the work that we do in dot &E. So there's three ways a program can get under oversight. There's a dollar threshold potential or something that's declared uh, inside uh, the defense circles as a major uh, defense acquisition program, and there's a variety of different ways that can happen. Um, so that's one. Another way is if Congress cares, I care. Uh, and the third way is that if it's a, it's a big change to something we already have or is a major capability development that uh, needs to be evaluated for operational capability, then we can, I, I have the, the uh, power to put programs under oversight for any of those reasons. Um, one of the uh, guiding principles to myself and the rest of my team is we've always said that we're about weapons that work. But one of the things that, one of the reasons I was brought into this job is to dial up the speed. But we don't want to create just fast, because you can get fast and bad, right? We want fast and excellent. We want fast and reliable. We want fast and suitable and effective and, where necessary, lethal. So what does that mean? We'll get into shift left in a minute. Actually, I think I'll get into it now. Uh, <laughs> so in order to get excellence in warfighting capability, but get it faster, we need to get a view of how it's going to work out operationally earlier in the development cycle, which is not necessarily a place where we're always going to be warmly welcomed. But it's an important aspect of any product design process, and I've studied this for a while, finding problems early, actually finding design alternatives early, and, and architectural structural problems early makes all the difference in the world to creating a capability within time and hopefully within budget. Um, you know, the old saying, uh, cost schedule performance, pick two, people say that? No, I mean, pick one to optimize and the other two are trade space. And oftentimes we end up trying to pick performance, but we're mostly constrained by time and money. So we need to balance those things. And from the operational test community, we don't necessarily have to live the program manager's life or nightmare of balancing those three. We're, we're very concerned with the operational impact of these systems and how they're going to be useful in the warfighting uh, pointy end of the spear. So when it comes to do that, weapons that work faster, we need to be more involved earlier in the design cycle architecture, contract language, deliverables, uh, understanding things like um, architecture precepts, digital engineering, digital twinning, taking credit for capabilities that are being delivered or being matured during the development cycle so that we could build that body of evidence so that when things come together into a finished form that can be usefully deployed, um, minimum viable capability release in the software pathway parlance. We want to have uh, as much data captured and as much awareness of whether or not it's going to be operationally useful along the timeline so when we get to the point where we have a deployable capability, we're not waiting to do some other testing that we could have taken credit for earlier. So weapons that work faster doesn't mean sloppy. It does mean high quality. It does mean that we need to be involved early to make sure that that is the outcome. Let's check and make sure I hit all the marks. That does mean, though, that we need some different tools and methods to do our work. there'll be more information that we need to capture along the way. There's more um, opportunities to use machine learning and, uh, and artificial intelligence in testing systems that are also using machine learning and artificial intelligence. Those are uh, muscles we haven't had a real uh, thorough chance to exercise yet, and I'm looking forward to being a part of that innovation cycle as well. 
And that's an area that, we've, uh, that we have a, a strong focus on, is capturing data so that it's useful and analyzable. Right now, that's, uh, we are kind of a paper-focused organization. We write reports, right? But we need to do that in a way that information can be captured and utilized in novel and innovative ways that help us illuminate um, how things are progressing as the development timeline progresses. And, um, but what that leads to then, it leads to another part of how Teeny is going to be different in the future. So we just talked about how we take credit for things as we go. When we get to something we might consider a capability that will be useful in the warfighting environment. Are we done? No. Uh, Bram mentioned that I was involved in developing what we called open architecture at the time for submarine sonar uh, in the mid-90s. And that's still a reasonably good model of behavior. I, you know, it could probably used to be uh, refreshed a little bit even more. But they continuously refreshing, not only the underlying technologies and the algorithms, but also their approach. So being a agile workforce and thinking, continuously thinking about how to do our business differently is a part of why I'm so excited to be here. So when we get to that minimum viable capability release or that, that, that releasable functional performance, we're not done. We're going to be changing it over time, just like we've been changing submarine sonar since APB 98. We're working on APB 21 right now. So we, that kind of program that's software reliant, uh, but f tied physically to you know, warfighting capability, is something that we're going to have more and more programs think about continuous change and rapid deployment of incremental capability. Some of my favorite tools of the trade, modularity, loose coupling, high cohesion, how do we add functional capabilities in a graceful way is something we need to have a better appreciation for in how we do operational test and evaluation as a life cycle proposition. So that's, uh, that's something we could use your energy on and think about and perhaps publish about how do we do a better job of doing operational tests of things that are built to change and how we evaluate that change over time. So that leads to the next element of what we want to address when it comes to revolutionizing t and &E the infrastructures, the tools, and the processes. The technology that people use to develop military capabilities is changing. The military capabilities we deliver are changing. The way we do operational test and evaluation needs to change too. And continuously, right? The development world is constantly changing. The warfighter demands are ever evolving. And so operational test and evaluation needs to change as well. Um, uh, my predecessor, Bob Beeler, uh, left me some gifts in coming into this job. Um, and uh, Dr. O'Toole did a great job in nurturing them and even creating some new innovation space during the time that he was in the saddle. So I'm in a great spot to carry forward this vision. But it's going to require a different set of, of tools and knowledge for the workforce. We need to be thinking about how do we engage in this uh, digital engineering process? How do we become more a part of uh, incremental capability development and releasing? How do we capture the data? What tools do we use to analyze the data? Oops, excuse me. Uh, also, the physical aspect of uh, doing operational tests, the ranges and laboratories. Uh, another gift I got was uh, uh, Director Beeler um, uh, commissioned the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, almost said math, <laughs> um, to uh, examine ranges and laboratories and think about, well, where should they go into the future? And they released a report in October. They're working on a classified annex to that right now. But you wouldn't be surprised to say, hey, we fight as a joint force. All our different mission systems have to interact with each other. But our ranges and laboratories need to interact with how they do testing. We need to be able to lash these things together. We need to work across multiple classification domains. We need to improve the kinds of um, facilities we have in those ranges for the kind of sensor laydowns we need to be able to replicate the 
um, opponent force um, problem set. Um, Secretary of Defense have talked at length about China being the pacing challenge. Um, and uh, they've got some good stuff. And our ranges need to be able to replicate what those things are and how our force works against them. So that's a physical change to our, our range infrastructure as well. I want to talk just for a second about the um, – sorry, let me get caught up with myself here. I mentioned digital twinning a minute ago. That's something I had a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in when I was at Carnegie Mellon, the, uh, the idea of having an architecture, populating the architecture with surrogates of what the functionality is going to be, see how that functionality is maturing as you populate the architecture with the real things that make up the overall system. And that's where we can start taking credit for um, capability as it's being developed and matured. Because we want um, to test representative capabilities, but we need to have an aperture for how it matures as it comes together as a complete whole. And then the next stop, next step is to think about interoperability. Our mission systems are going to be changing perhaps more rapidly than they've done in the past and in smaller increments. That will have an impact to how they interoperate. We're going to need to think about how we test interoperability differently as a part of an ever-changing environment. That's very new, and I'm not even going to pretend to tell you we've got it figured out. We're still even trying to frame the question. But that's something we're really going to have to work together, and I'm excited about the work that some of the changes that are going on in the department with a chief data and IA officer and some of the other um, work we've been doing with Jake and others to better understand how interoperability is going to change over time and how we do operational tests of that shifting functionality. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about um, how my organization is uh, positioned to be able to embrace that change. Um, over uh, about a year ago, uh, Dr. O'Toole in implemented a reorganization, which I'm especially excited about. Uh, he took the equity of live fire and distributed it across the kind of the, the heavy lifting part of the organization of you know air, sea, space, and cyber but retained a fifth part of the organization to focus on strategic, strategic initiatives. What should we be doing differently? What kind of new tools do we need? What new policies do we need? How do we connect ourselves more thoroughly with the rest of the practitioner community? That's being led by Dr. Hobson. She's doing a great job of it. But that, that part of my organization exists I'm particularly happy about because that is the place where we will make that lasting difference that will be able to be spread across a broader range of functions and uh, things that drive capability into the future uh, to our warfighters in a way that will keep them ever in an unfair fight. We don't want our people to be in a fair fight. We want it to be an unfair fight to our advantage. But that means we just have to move faster. All right. So let's talk about uh, uh, kind of my last big topic to talk about, and that's uh, cyber survivability. Uh, so I've worked in programs, um, uh, remember we, we were working on this one sensor package that would also be able to be able to do uh, uh, digital transmit receive on a, in a different um, domain. And the folks who were working on that program, uh, I'm not going to name names here, uh, but um, the idea that they were going to be an IP socket, right, that they were going to be exchanging information at a digital level, um, they were like, ah, do we have to do all this IA stuff? I was like, eh, it's not that big a deal if you're not under attack all the time. It's a joke, right? <laughs> Sorry, I haven't been very funny today. But, uh, but it's a big deal, right? And we are, if you look at our uh, annual report that we put out in January, um, it's, got my, it's got my picture on the cover. Um, it's a big body of work. Most all of it was done before I showed up. But uh, I read through it, and it's really shocking in places how underperforming we are in this area of cyber survivability. 
and we're making a big deal out of it. Uh, this deputy secretary has asked me about it specifically, and I gave her some preliminary information, and she was not happy with where we are, but it's good that we have the visibility on it. There's a lot of things we could be doing a whole lot better with just doing basic bookkeeping and house cleaning stuff. Now, cyber survivability is a thick and thorny topic, but it, you, you don't even get into the thick and thorny part if you don't do the simple stuff first. So we're just trying to hold the bar to say, make sure you already do the things you have requirements and funding to do, and make sure it actually gets into the system. When we find it as a part of operational tests, you really need to fix it. And then we could up our game as we get more, um, more practiced across the department in cyber survivability. It's, and changing the discussion around survivability is having an impact in the department. Uh, this isn't just something about hygiene that you could get yourself cleaned up later. Uh, we're chatting recently with um, a Marine Corps general who's not interested in hygiene, but I'm interested in survivability, so you have my attention. So we're going to play through that and make sure that people are aware that it isn't something that you can just do later. Uh, the uh, opponents are omnipresent and constantly vigilant, and we need to be uh, constantly defending. That's an, another aspect of the problem is establishing cyber defenders in order to do cyber defense. You know, think about the mission systems we have, you know, radars and combat management and missiles and torpedoes and all these different things that are all got software in them, they're all cyber re re reliant. How are they defended? So we need to be thinking about that and positioning ourselves to be able to do that excellently, because the last thing we want to do is to go into a fight with fantastic capabilities and have it all turned off for us as soon as we show up. So um, that's a, a big part of how we're going to be thinking about cyber survivability going forward and making sure that people are aware this isn't something they can kick the can on anymore. All right, one last note before I, I'm happy to take your questions. Um, publishing, thinking about what you're doing, identifying innovations, <clears throat> making it known to others so that you can be a part of that rising tide. <clears throat> I published my first piece on uh, acquisition change in uh, 98, and it was uh, like a historical treatise on how we've done sonar system development in the past and how hard it was to have to create our own microchips and how many different operating systems and, um, and different uh, ways we had to do different parts of the system in order to make a cohesive whole. And it was a nightmare. We had to spend about half of our money just on doing our own maintenance, on figuring out what was breaking in our system and how to fix it. Thank God we don't have to do that anymore, right? Um, but I wrote about it. Nobody else would have. Well, maybe somebody would have eventually, but uh, nobody else did. And that helped illuminate this change in practice. And we moved it across into different places. It became a part of how the Defense Department now thinks about doing capability delivery. Uh, so it, it was a maybe not the easiest read in the world. It was my first, after all. But uh, leaning out in front of getting information more widely known is an important part of being a concerned and engaged professional, in my personal opinion. <clears throat> Doesn't mean it all has to be public, right? If you're working on something as a great innovation, but it's something we need to be tightly held, hey, there's ways of getting that information around. We have classified forms. Let's make sure we have an engagement in that as well. So uh, not everything has to be made completely publicly available, but the, when you're doing an innovation, when you're trying something new, capture it. Tell other people about it. Make it a part of forums like this so we can all learn and grow together. And with that, I will take your questions. I think we've got people out on in the virtual world, so if you use the microphone so everybody can hear, I think that'll be really helpful. Which, by the way, means that it's going to, there's a lot of you who are thinking like, yeah, microphone? Uh, I'm not sure I want to do that. 
Um, we, don't, do we, we don't have provision for somebody writing down questions on cards, right? So, that, so one of the problems, I'm sorry, I'm going to just bear with me for a minute. <laughs> one of the problems with big forums like this is not everybody's comfortable with going up in front of a microphone like that brave young man. But um, you all have great ideas, and that's one of the things I learned about in human-centered design is capturing ideas from a variety of sources means that you need to be open to other ways of getting people's ideas. And, and sometimes this kind of forum where the only way to get a question to me is in front of a microphone might be a little daunting. Step up. It's going to be okay. You're among friends. And my new best friend. All right. Hello. Uh, I'm Logan Osmond. I'm with IDA. And uh, I have a question that's probably a couple of parts. But um, the, f the first is that yesterday we heard a lot about cultural change. And today we're hearing about cultural change. And <clears throat> I think some of my observations with T&E, especially OT&E, have been how do we get the PMs, the user communities, uh, uh, all on board with the cultural changes in addition to the test community? Because I feel like it's not just one, it's all of them together. I need the operational conditions. And then how do I get all that in a test environment? You know, when we talk about interoperability, it's not just the software. A lot of people seem to think, well, if the software works, it works. But those design choices can be one way or another depending on how the user is going to use it. And if I don't design it for the user's actual use, it might work, but it doesn't work. So I guess, how do you see DOT and E uh, engaging to get those uh, uh, things addressed? All right, an above average question. So. <laughs> um, so see, setting the bar, right? Everybody else can jump in. Um, OK, so let's talk about uh, culture change. So when I, was, uh, when I took over the Navy's open architecture um, challenge to the department, when I was in the PEO for Integrated Warfare Systems, we had a three-part initiative to change the business, technical, and cultural approach for acquisition aligned to this idea of open architecture. But through way too many scars, I learned that the cultural part was really excruciatingly hard. But putting together different technical practices and business practices was, you know, coming up with different design uh, choices and different ways of bringing forward design alternatives. Um, the business practices could be done with things like guidebooks and pamphlets and presentations and outreach. So it was a lot easier to change how people do what they do, and eventually, by doing things in a different way, the culture changes. So culture change maybe not is, uh, as the forefront of your effort, but changing what people do, and the culture changes as a lagging indicator of having impact. So to that point, though, um, I think that what happened uh, with the last uh, USDA ATNL and completely revamping the uh, defense acquisition instruction around the, the notion of um, agile and adaptive and having the uh, major capabilities and the business and, and software, you know, these other frameworks and putting different practices as tool sets into the hands of the acquisition community and how it relates to industry will have a long-term impact that will end up shaping culture. Thank you. Another question? Please. Hi, Laura Freeman, Virginia Tech. And I wanted to kind of ask you to expand on your thoughts on cyber survivability. We actually had a short course here on Tuesday on cyber resiliency, because um, we know the threat's there and it's going to get in if it tries hard enough. And so how do we design our systems to be resilient in the presence of that threat? And this kind of pulls in your thoughts on shift left as well. And that a comment that the instructor got from some of the people in the course afterwards was, okay, but we're testers. All we can do is kind of observe the problem afterwards. We can't influence the design of the system. So I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on how people in this room that are maybe observing the problem or how dot and &E can help advocate for more cyber survivability through resiliency. So a shift left is a big part of that. A great question. Thank you, by the way. So we went from above average to great. Who knows what the next one's going to be? Um, the uh, So 
it takes a lot of effort to build excellent cyber security and survivability into, uh, into these complex mission systems. So if you don't start out with, a, uh, with the requirements and the resources to put in cyber survivability as a design precept early on in the design cycle, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to be in a good position to be able to fight off the uh, omnipresent offenders. So uh, getting into uh, helping to shape requirements and looking at early stage design from an operational test perspective is critically important to not being a witness to a train wreck. And we do that too often. So uh, shift left is a big part of that. Getting those equities established and then occasionally visiting to make sure those equities aren't traded off over time because program managers, we've rewarded program managers in the past to wring every last dollar out of their program to drive to function. Infrastructure, cybersecurity, ugh, hard. Uh, it's churn, I, I'll deal with it later. No, no, the operational test guy is gonna beat you senseless from the beginning to the end. You gotta get it in there. So uh, that's a big part of, it's not an easy problem, by the way. We've been doing this not the right way for a long time and it's gonna, it's a, it's a big ship, it's moving fast, I'm gonna turn the rudder, but it's not gonna turn right away. Um, so some patience will be required, but we're going to have to insist on it as well. Hey, sir, uh, Ed Powell from Test Resource Management Center. Uh, so this year we're going to see two new heavy lift vehicles launched, uh, SLS, which has taken 12 years and $6 billion to develop, and the Starship, which has taken a few years and a couple hundred million dollars to develop. And we all expect the SLS to succeed and probably <laughs> the Starship to blow up. Um, but if the SLS fails, uh, it'll set the program back years. If the Starship fails, it'll set the program back weeks. And I think, what can we do, what can you do, and what can we do to try to get the defense industry to try fast, fail fast, to move into the more SpaceX way of, of doing things for weapon systems rather than the 12 years, $6 billion, everything's got to work on the first time kind of mentality because I think, I think that mentality is, is leaving our war fighters at risk sometimes when the Starship mentality might, um, might help them quicker. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, fantastic question. <laughs> um, so, uh, if, if you've ever taken an Agile course, you might see one of those uh, cartoons where you start with a skateboard and you end up with a race car. I don't believe that, right? If you want a race car, you need to think about building a race car. But the idea of building it incrementally so that you end up you know, learning as you go, not a big fan of failure, but uh, that's the lexicon of the day, so we'll say fail fast. Uh, but uh, trying out things and testing them in pieces as you go, um, is a big part of de-risking a program. The other thing that uh, is not lost on me is that uh, digital engineering is a heavy lift. Getting that set as a part of how programs progress and, and making that big investment in people and, and uh, tools is something that um, some programs have done excellently and they reap the benefits by being able to do design spirals on a tighter timeline because they did the hard work of modeling and simulation. Just because you're doing modeling and simulation doesn't mean it's cheap. And it, so we need to make sure that we're appropriately investing in the tools necessary to be able to go fast. But also having tolerance for early failure. That's another thing that um, programs I've worked on in the past, if, you know, if you miss the, it's one of the benefits, I should say, of programs I've worked on in the past, instead of having a an episodic upgrade cycle where it might be three, five, ten years between driving a, a new piece of functionality where everybody tries to jam things in because if they miss this train, they've got to wait years for the next one. Well, we're not going to get it in this year. We've got another capability opportunity next year or next week or next month or tomorrow, right? Um, for some of our mission systems that are more pure uh, software, you can get into uh, continuous design spirals or uh, integration, rapid integration and delivery cycles. So uh, doing the hard engineering work up front, 
having the right kind of tools, uh, tolerance for failure, and incremental capability deliveries are ways that we get into, uh, out of, I should say, this idea that the only way to get your functionality out there is to get on that train that only delivers on very long timelines and being willing to have smaller functionality increases on tighter timelines and delivered more rapidly. 